2 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, your success in your Christian life could have come in your brain and your heart, amen. But notice what it says, verse 1. Now I am Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, I just like to get a hold of that and that thing get a hold of me. Christ was gentle and he was meek. But that doesn't mean he wasn't bold. There's a difference. People miss mistake sometimes boldness for meanness and the truth can be sharp when you preach it with boldness but it doesn't mean that you're not a gentleman or meek man right amen who in presence and base among you but being absent bold towards you but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I'm present with you. Paul said, hey, I'd rather be humble with you and not have to look you in the face and point my finger at you and blast you. Amen? Right? Amen. Listen, that's what preachers don't want to come in and blast people. I want to help you. I want to be true. I want to be humble. All right? Notice what it says, with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to. See, the average person, when a preacher gets bold and he's preaching, they'll say, well, man, he was in the flesh today. Right? That's what they say. I mean, they just think you're in the flesh because you're getting bold with them. You know, the truth, sometimes you got to apply a little bit of extra facial features with it. <laughs> get a little red in the face and get a few veins bulging in your forehead and you know, some tendons in your neck coming out, right? Right? Amen. And they think, well, the preacher's in the flesh. Amen. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I, we want a war in the flesh, right? I mean, let's just clear the chairs out and have an MMA ring, amen? No holes barred. I mean, there's a bunch of people who would love that. We'd probably pack this place out, right? We'd have cheers and beers, amen. But that ain't that ain't the way God wants it, amen. Though we walk in the flesh, literally, we're in a human body, but we don't choose to duke it out with people. Why? Because we humble ourselves, we submit the cause to Christ and ask Him to spiritually work and move on their hearts and change their hearts and their minds. Amen? Because we put down the gloves. That I'm not here to fight with you. I just want to tell you about the Lord and that He loves you and He cares about you and He doesn't want you to go to hell and He doesn't want have sin to have dominion over you and He don't want sin to control you because it's ruining your home, it's ruining your life, it's ruining your head, it's ruining your heart, it's ruining everything, and God wants to give you the victory over this stuff. Right? Amen. We, and he wants to talk some sense into people is what God's trying to do. That's why he chose preaching. For the weapons, not a gun, not a knife, of our warfare, not what? Carnal. Show, that's showing you it's physical. We're dealing with the flesh. Carnal. Physical. Right? He said, I could not speak on his spiritual, but as on the babes, uh, as carnal. He, even as babes, what he says in 1 Corinthians 3. Showing you carnal has to do with physical. Amen? But mighty through God, pulling down what? Let me ask you a question. You got something that's got a hold of you? He's talking about pulling down a stronghold, something that's got your mind. People get something in their head, and it gets them, man. Positive or negative, I mean, it's there. And it controls the way they live and how they act and what they do. It, it becomes a mindset in their life that controls them. I'll give you an example. Somebody uh, in Maxwell's book, a guy was getting a tattoo. And I'm not for that, but a guy was getting a tattoo. And as he's looking through, he noticed these things on there and it says, born to lose. And he goes, do people really get that put on them? He goes, before tattooed on body, tattooed on mind. You understand? 
That means they, they picked that, they adopted that idea and they want to put it on their body, born to lose, because in their mind they already think they're a loser. You see what I'm saying? So it's been, somebody has projected that upon their brain and they believe they're a loser, so they want to tattoo that on their body so everybody knows, hey, I'm a loser. Amen? And it's very easy to do, to get that. If somebody keeps telling you, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, sooner or later you're going to say, I'm no good. Right? You say, preacher, that's all you ever do. You show people there's a filthy, rotten, dirty, good enough for sinners. Amen? Pulling down strongholds. Watch it. Verse 5, casting down imaginations. That's up to you to grab that thought when it comes in your ears, to grab a hold of that and say, I'm not going to go there and put it in the blood of Jesus Christ and get rid of it. You have to take control of your brain. That's what it's trying to tell you. Casting down strongholds or casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of who? So what you got is you got the knowledge you got here and you got some high thing coming in and wanting to climb over top of what God wants and what God says and trump God's truth and knowledge. Right? So where would that thought come from? The devil, why? Because he wants to exalt his throne above God's throne. So he wants to exalt something, whether it's earthly, whether it's anything that you know, above what God says and place a higher authority above God's authority. See, the battle's authority and the battle's over God's book. And then you're going to do it God's way or you're going to do it man's way. You're a man, so your way or God's way. My way or the highway, right? That's what, right? And uh, so people sit back and say, well, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. That, that includes God, right? Listen, we got to yield ourselves to God and go, God, it's your way. Your way works. You, got, you wrote the book. You have the truth, and it's up to me to obey it. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. It don't matter what Biden says. It doesn't matter what Trump says. It doesn't matter what your parents say. When it comes to the truth of the Word of God, we must obey God rather than man. Men, right? Bringing captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we got to get the right thinking. We got to get the thinking right. And the way to get thinking right is when those thoughts come in your head, you got to control them. You just can't say, oh, that was a good thought, and you just keep replaying it, replaying it, replay, replay. Re we keep replaying those kind of thoughts, bad thoughts. Amen? God said, no, get a hold of that thing. Get that thought. Get it in obedience to Jesus Christ. Put it under the blood. Amen? Amen? Listen, there ought not be a thought in your head that hadn't been rinsed in the blood of Christ. The thing comes in, so, oh, that's a bad thought. Put it in the blood. Wash it. Amen? Get rid of it. Amen? God wants you to be thinking right things, good things. Amen? Biblical things, scriptural things. Notice what it says, verse 6. Having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is you know what he mean? You know what he's saying there? Make your wrongs right. Right? A readiness to avenge all disobedience. Saying what? I disobeyed. I did wrong. He said, get it right. Get your thinking right and get your behavior to follow proper thinking. The reason why people behave wrong is because they think wrong. Right? And if you will think right, you'll behave right. Amen. I mean, that's what he's trying to tell you. Get that disobedience taken care of. How? By getting your thoughts in obedience to Christ. And when your mind's in obedience to Christ, you'll be able to obey. But if your head's full of wrong thinking, you'll never obey. Right? So different thinking. Let's see what different type of thinking. Number one, we've got a trapped mind. A trapped mind. There's people think that they're stuck in their mind and they can't ever get out because they believe they're trapped. A trapped mind. Amen? And uh, they said, this is the way I am. This is the way I always will be. I can't ever change. Well, you're trapped. Right? Let's look in Philippians 3. 
And we've got a lot of scripture we're going to cover. That's why it's probably going to be all day long preaching. But Philippians chapter number 3. Look, listen, I love verse 10. That I may know him. See that? And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of suffering, being made conformable on his death. If by any means I might attain unto what? The resurrection of the dead, not as though I've already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm chasing the right thing. And in the end, I want what Christ wants from me is what he's saying. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing, what? I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth and those things which are. You see that? You know what you got to do? You got to get rid of your past. You got to get rid of your past failures. Sometimes people can't get past failure. They can't get past hurting somebody, saying something bad, or somebody said something bad to them. Amen, or you messed up. Well, we're all going to mess up. You know what every successful person has in common? Failure. They found out what not to do so they can figure out what to do. Right? You know what the greatest failure is? Not learning from it. Amen? You not you want to be a success? Learn from your failures. Amen? Amen. Everybody that's a success has learned from failure. I mean, how many times did Thomas Edison fail making a light bulb? Look where light bulbs are at today. Thank God he kept persistent. Right? He kept working and kept working. He learned what not to do and he did it. And uh, too many times we give up. Too many times we fail. Amen. Determination goes a long ways, doesn't it? Amen. Notice what he says. Forgetting those things behind. He says, verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's reaching forth to something. He's got a goal that he's going towards. And he says, I'm not going to let nothing stay me. I'm going to the prize. And I'm not going to stop until I get the prize. No matter how many times I fail, no matter how many times I fall, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get out of this mess. I'm going to get out of the gutter. I'm going to get out of the trap. I'm going to change this mindset. I'm not going to live there. I'm not going to dwell there. I'm pressing toward the mark. People got a trapped mind. They're stuck. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. This verse blew me away when I read it. Hebrews chapter 11. I found out something neat about Hebrews 11. They said there's 16 people mentioned in Hebrews 11. 16, 11. <laughs> chapter 11, there's 16 people mentioned. I thought that was a pretty good nugget I was given by Brother Robertson the other night. Uh, verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. See that? Verse 15. And truly, if they had been what? Mindful. Their mind's full of it. Of that country from whence they what? Came out. They might have opportunity to what? See? There's people, they get saved. And they can't quit thinking about the drugs. They can't quit drinking about, thinking about the fornication. They can't quit thinking about the booze. They can't quit thinking about all that sin. They'll go back into it. Amen? Like we talked last week, when you get saved, you've got to replace it. If you don't replace it with something good, something's going to fill the void. Right? If you're going to take rock and roll out of a man's life, you better give him good, good music to fill that void. He's going right back into the same music or other things. He's got to replace it. We've got to find things to replace it. You, get, you find a man that's occupied and living in sin, he's got to find a way to go somewhere to where he can get out of sin. That's why it's so important to have a discipleship program or be able to have fellowship or have somebody over to where you can teach him the Bible and do some things to get him away from all that stuff. It's real hard. Listen, we've seen men, they'll get saved in a jail and they get out and their girlfriend or their mom will take them off someplace and then you never get them established in church and next thing they're out with their buddies and then they're back drinking and they're out smoking and they're out getting a job and they're getting busy wrapped up in the world and they never get established in church. 
got to get them established in. You got to get them in the book and you got to get them in church. If you don't, their mind, you got to change that whole pattern of thinking. I said it before. My brother-in-law said, well, I'm just going over here to the Dayton Lounge or whatever it was over there on Dixie Avenue. And he's just going to go in there and shoot a little pool. Yeah, he shot a little pool. And all his old Coke buddies found him. Messed him up. You understand? You're just going to go in there, buy a pack of cigarettes, shoot some pool, drink a Coke. Yeah. And then they gave him the wrong Coke. You understand? You just can't go around the old buddies. The old buddies are going to take you somewhere you don't want to go. He said, what happened? He wound up dying in a halfway house on Dixie Avenue. They found him dead on the floor in a halfway house. What was it a halfway house? There's a rent a room house, anyways, whatever you call it. It's a shame. You understand? You got to get people out of that stuff. Listen, there's a song out there. I love it. He said, You took me out of Egypt, now take Egypt out of me. You got to get Egypt out of people. And the only way you can get Egypt out of people is they got to get around the truth. And we got to be able to spend time with people to get them there. It's the only hope they have. Their mind's full. What's your mind full of? If it's all about the past and they're listening to all that rock and roll and they're listening to all that fornication and they're seeing all that stuff, listen, what's going to happen? You know, the one girl uh, in Mississippi, I wound up getting a leader to the Lord one night, but she had this attitude. She was 16, got pregnant. She had a baby. And then next thing you know, she's divorced by the time she's 18 because they got married because they had to, because they had a kid, but they weren't meant to be each other, but she just had to fool around. You understand? And uh, she had this attitude is, I got to get a hook. Got to get a hook. I said, what do you mean by hook? I just got to get a hook. She's talking about getting another man. She just ate up to get another man. I said, well, what's going to happen if you get another man? You just going to get another baby donor? You, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you're going to get a man that's going to raise these kids? She just had to have a hook. Just had to have, her mind was ate up. I just got to have a hook. You'll ruin your life if that's all you think about. Why don't she have a mindset saying, I got to have God, got to have God, got to have God. Got to have a new mindset. She had a trapped mind. She just thought she had to have a physical relationship with somebody and that would satisfy and bring what she wanted, but that's not going to be satisfying. Right? How many women out there are single mothers raising babies? Tons of them. You understand? But they just had to have a hook. You understand? They're trapped. They're thinking, I just got to go out there. I'm going to die an old maid. No, you're going to die a single mama raising babies that they're not going to have a daddy and then you're going to have hell on earth trying to support them. See, they don't think it through because they're watching too much Hollywood. They got too much junk. Their mind's trapped in a place it shouldn't be. Ephesians chapter 4. He said, you just don't want people to have fun. I don't want people to have ruined lives. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as others who? Gentiles walk where? In the vanity where? Of their mind. So what's vanity? It's emptiness. <laughs> Amen. The things they're thinking, the Bible says, vanity is worthless. It's not even worth pinning down. It's nothing. To God, it's nothing. The things that they're chasing out there, the Gentiles are chasing, God said, it's vanity. Nothing. There's nothing to it worth anything. Why? It's all going to burn. Everything they're chasing is worthless. Nothing. He said the nations are counted as less than nothing. So if China and America and Russia and all that's counted less than nothing, how much more than the people that live in those nations, what they're chasing and thinking about? Less than nothing, that's minus zero. <laughs> right? And, and he says this is how their, their vanity of their minds. Look at what it says, 18. Having the understanding what? Darkened, being what? Alienated from the life of God. They're alienated from it. 
My soul, friends, we're trying to reach sinners with the gospel. They don't know what they're doing. They're chasing after something that's nothing. And when they get there, they get nothing. And they wind up in hell because they sought nothing. They're alienated from the life of God. God ain't nowhere around them. They're keeping them out of school. They don't want them to go to church. They don't want them to see the Bible. They don't want them to hear preaching. The devil's doing everything. You say, no, you don't want to hear that. Come on, come with me. Come on, chase Hollywood over here. Listen to this rock and roller over here. Chase this ball over here. Go to this game over there. Let's go to this movie here over there. The devil's doing everything he can to alienate people from the gospel. From the life of God. Through what? The ignorance. That is what? What is ignorance? They just don't know. You know what the devil wants to do? Keep you ignorant. So I don't know what the Bible says. That's exactly the way the devil wants you. Well, I didn't know the Bible said that. Exactly where the devil wants you. Well, I didn't know God expected that. I mean, that's what, exactly what the devil wants. Right? Hey, man, he's got them right where he wants them. They just don't know, and they just don't seem to care. Right? Because the blindness of, they don't even know what they want. They're blind. They're blind spiritually. They don't even know what they want. And the devil's got them chasing something, and when you offer them the truth, they're so blind. It's, ah, ain't nothing good in that. Right? Why? You know why most people don't want nothing to do with Christianity? It's because somebody said something bad about it, and therefore it's already put in their mind that it's no good, there's nothing there, that Christianity's fake, so they believe the lie. And they'll die and go into hell believing that lie because they're not going to investigate it themselves because somebody already told them that it's bad. I mean, I'll give you an example. Years ago, we're sitting at the dinner table and dinner's made. Dad says, you could eat that? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, I don't like it. He said, how do you know? You never tasted it. I said, I, don't, I just don't like it. He said, but you don't know. You've never tried it. You're right, but I don't like the way it looks. I ain't going to try it. He said, you don't know what you're missing. He said, there's more for me then. I said, you have to help yourself. I don't want it. Didn't know what it tasted like because I didn't try it. And then one day I tried it. Found out I've been missing something. You understand? Ain't that funny the way we are? Think that we don't like something because of the way it looks? Find out, man, we are dumb. Right? Amen, amen. Look at what it says. Who being past what? Feeling. Have given himself over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with. And I wrote a little word right beside there. Hog wild. Right? What they done? The world's going hog wild after sin. Right? I mean, when you watch these videos, these YouTube videos where these people wrestling in the mud, running in the mud, diving in the mud, just like a bunch of hogs. You see these girls out there just caked with mud from head to toe, wrestling and throwing each other in the slop in the mud. All wild. The world's just going nuts. He's going after the filth and corruption, partying. You drive down here, this brewery, it's always packed. People would rather go to booze than they would to come to church. Why? Their heart's alienated. They think there's something about drinking horse pee. That horse pee, that's what beer is, is bacterial urine. Amen. They asked some preacher one time, did you ever have a beer? He said, no, I told him pour it back in the horse. Amen. I'm just being honest with you. Amen. It, that bacteria urinates. Amen. And eats that yeast and bit urinates, and that's what it is. It's urine. Look at it. It's urine. It's bacterial urine. And then they're, they're down there thinking they're smart, having fun, and drinking it. Oh, amen. That's how, ain't that how the, and no, none of them want a cold beer. I mean, a warm beer, they all want cold beer. Isn't that something? The devil's got to make it nice and cold for you to be able to be palatable to drink it. But they don't like the taste of that stuff. That's why they got to doctor it up. See, there's something that they're chasing down there they think that they're looking for and they can't find it. 
Then they're out there puking their guts out. And, oh, man, did we have a time last night? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you had a real good time, right? You're hugging the toilet. You understand? I mean, the devil's got them convinced, man. They're drinking the whiskey. They're drinking the booze. They're smoking the dope. They're ruining their lives. They're throwing their paychecks away, and they think that, man, they're chasing something, and they think, man, we really got it. We're sitting around having a good time on the highway to hell. They're blinded through the ignorance that's in them, and they're running with all greediness. What? In lasciviousness. That's excess of lust. It's a shame, ain't it? Look what it says. But you have not learned what? So learn Christ. If so be you've heard of him and have been taught by him, as the truth is where? See, that's where it's at. The devil's told him, there ain't no truth in Jesus. He was fake. He wasn't real. He's not here. He don't exist. What he's telling them. You know what they're doing? They're buying a hook, line, sinker. Amen. Colossians chapter 1. A trapped mind. Man, we may spend a month on this subject. There's so much in the Bible on your mind. Look at chapter 1, verse 20. And having made peace, how? Through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things on himself, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated, see that? And what? Enemies where? In your mind, how? By wicked works, yet now hath he. Isn't that amazing? Our head was so polluted with filth and corruption. Amen. We were separated, alienated from God through the junk in our heads because of the things that we did, the things that we heard, the things that we said. Yet he still came to us to give us a chance. He loved us anyway. <laughs> and you who are sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind. See, these people are their own worst enemies. They don't even understand. Verse 22, In the body of his flesh through the death to present you holy and unblameable, unprovable how? Man, it's those I've never sinned. I've been justified in his presence. Through the shed blood of his cross, through the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, he gave me a free gift of eternal life. Man, what a deal. These people got no idea what's going on down there. Mm. Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Boy, I tell you. They don't know. They're trapped. They're trapped. Verse 18. For as many... Walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Watch it. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame. Watch it. Who mind earthly things. Their mind's trapped. They're stuck. So what are they doing? They're thinking on the wrong thing. They're thinking about this earth. They're not thinking about eternity. They're not thinking about God in heaven. They're not thinking about living with God forever. They're not thinking about hell. Their mind is stuck on bills and money and sex and drugs and fun and pleasure, amen, and politics. It's, it's on everything earthly, and they're not thinking anything heavenly. Dak said it the other day. You know, he said, you ever heard people say you're, you're so uh, heavenly minded, you're no earthly good? Well, I can tell you there's a lot of Christians that are so earthly minded, they ain't no heavenly good. Amen? Amen, amen. Now look what it says for our conversation. It has to do with what you're talking about. Your conversation, how you're living, right, is where. You see the difference? Their mind in earthly things, he said, our conversation's up there. We're thinking about heaven. We're thinking about going home. We're thinking about being with Him. Right? So it ought to change the way you live down here because you got your mind full of what's up there. From whence also we look for who? 
Brother Rob. Go on up, brother. Amen. Amen. Look for the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to do all things to himself. I am looking for that change. I am ready to launch. Amen. I'm ready to be zapped and turned into a new creature. Amen. Get my glorified body. Amen. It will never hurt. Amen. Never have a muscle ache again, a bone ache, a, a headache, or none other kind of aches. Amen. I'm ready to go. Amen. Go change. Next. Uh, this is where the average person's at. This is why they're on drugs. This is why they're drinking. This is why they're in a mental institution because they have a troubled mind. It's sad. They have a troubled mind. Let's turn to the book of Daniel. They have a troubled mind. I want some people to be troubled over their sin that God would come and save them. That's why men don't want to hear preaching because it troubles them. But they run from God troubling them. Daniel chapter 4, talking about Nebuchadnezzar. He's having a dream and he gets troubled by it. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. And I saw in a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head, what? Troubled me. You know, that's where a sinner needs to hear about hell, realize his sin is going to put him in hell and get troubled. But see, they're troubled about a lot of different things out there instead of the things that God's concerned with. Right? Amen. Chapter 5. Verse 5. In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand and rode over against a candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts were troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote against one another. That's what I like, trembling. We need trembling sinners. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions in my head. What? Trouble me. There's a saved man. He's seen what's coming upon this earth, and he said, oh, my God. He got trouble. We got people who got troubled minds. You understand? Let's look at Matthew. Troubled mind. What are you thinking about? There's people that are troubled today. There's people in a mental institution. Some people actually have a mental issue. I'm not minimizing somebody that actually was born retarded, can't get their brain to work. But there's a bunch of people over the mental institution that's committed sin and never confessed it and went nuts. And then you got a bunch of people that claim to be insane when they're not trying to get out of crimes that they've committed. And there's a bunch of people carrying around guilt that they've never got it covered under the blood and they're ate up with guilt. Chapter 3, or chapter 2, verse 3. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. What? They're looking for the king. Said, where is the king of the Jews? Luke chapter 10. This is a real good one. Talking about Mary and Martha. Two sisters. Amen. And the Lord comes over to the house. Amen. And uh, verse 39, and it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and what? Heard the word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? 
Bid her therefore that she help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful, full of care, and troubled about what? Many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Full of care. She's troubled. People get worked up instead of learning how to cast their cares upon the Lord. They carry those things and they get all troubled on the inside. And the world offers all kinds of remedies and medicines and things like that to try to calm your nerves. Uh, I remember when my grandpa died, you know, my aunt was a nurse trying to give grandma volume, you know, putting in there so, you know, sedate her so she could well, get through the funeral because grandpa died. And I remember my uncle John diving in the casket, grabbing grandpa and pulling him up and crying. And I mean, people freaking out, man. Trouble tore up. Listen, you got to. Cast all that. I remember my cousin coming to me at Grandpa's funeral and goes, you didn't love Grandpa. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're not crying. I said, I know where Grandpa's at. I got saved because of him. I know where I'm going, man. Grandma and Grandpa told me about Jesus. He's in heaven, man. He ain't there. You understand? But that cousin's out of her mind today. She's lost her family. She's lost her children. She turned into a heroin addict. The last I heard with her son and she's a mess, but I'm the one that's lost my mind, and she's the one that's got the troubled mind, and I got the sound mind. Amen? But they think I'm whack because I follow Jesus. Amen. Let's look in Acts. Acts 15. Well, I tell you, troubled mind, troubled mind will drive people to do things that they shouldn't. Amen? Look at verse uh, 24. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. You know, those religious people will trouble people's mind. They get people all worked up. There's religious people tell you, you can lose your salvation. There ain't nothing more worse than being saved and told you to lose your salvation, and they're twisting the scriptures to subvert your souls and mess you up to get you under their thumb and under their control. You know what eternal security does? It frees you. We have to live for God and serve God and not be under any man's bondage, but you're yielded to him and you understand the truth. Amen? That if you ever do sin in your Christian life, you're not going to go to hell and he's not going to throw you away. Amen? You know it'll trouble you thinking you've lost it. That, I'm guarantee you, I've been there. You talk about trouble, you. I, I was. Amen. That'll mess you up. Amen. Like my wife, she got saved and she went to the preacher. He kept telling her, "You can lose your salvation." She said, "What do you got to do to lose it? What sin are you gonna do?" He said, "Well, you'll just know." Said, what sin is it? Because I don't want to do it. Right? Amen. I mean, it, you know, they'll mess with you. I'm glad my salvation ain't based on what I do. It's based on what he did. Proverbs 21. Troubled mind, man. Troubled. Christians can get troubled. Listen, that's why the Lord wants us to cast all our care upon him. He wants us to, to unload our thoughts and our problems to him. Let him carry our load. Verse 27. Proverbs 21, 27. The sacrifice of who? The wicked is an abomination. How much more when he bringing it with a wicked mind? You know what? The wicked are. They're an abomination to God. How much more if they bring it with a wicked mind? You got wicked minds, man. I guarantee you, Joe Biden is nothing but a full-blown abomination to God Almighty. America ain't blessed having that reprobate in our uh, White House. Amen? That's the judgment of God upon a nation for rejecting God's book and the man that was before him and the man that was before him and the man that was before him. Amen! And we're not going to be any better if Trump gets in there. Amen? He may be selling Bibles and doing all that kind of stuff and claiming he's going to bring some things back, but I'm telling you, he's got some abominations. Unless that man gets truly born again and say that I'm a born again blood-washed Christian, been saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, I won't believe it until I hear it come out of his mouth. Amen? 
Amen. Uh, next, Matthew chapter 6. Talking about different minds. People have a trapped mind. They have a troubled mind. This is one of the most popular minds. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. Most people understand what verse 33 is, right? But seek ye first. The kingdom of who? God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added on to you. Verse 32, for after these things, what is that? Verse 31, therefore take no thought, saying what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal we shall be clothed, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth what you have need of, or need need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Very important, ain't it? Verse 34. Therefore, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient, under the day is evil. There, uh, people have a tomorrow mind. Tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. You know what they are? They're procrastinators. You know what Dan Metter said years ago? He said procrastination is the recruiting officer of hell. Put it off to tomorrow. Why do today when you can put it off to tomorrow? That's procrastination, right? Amen. They just keep putting it off, keep putting it off, keep putting it off. Amen. A tomorrow mind. Let's look in uh, Exodus chapter 8. Tomorrow mind. I'll get it right tomorrow. Take care of it tomorrow. Keep putting it off. Exodus chapter 8. Moses had brought the plague of frogs down upon the people. Verse 8, And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I'll let the people go that they may do sacrifice on the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee, for thy servants and for thy people, to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses that they may re Remain in the river only. And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word, and thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord thy God. There's a frog everywhere. In their beds, in their bedpans, I mean, in their cooking instruments, in their ovens. I mean, the frogs are everywhere. They can't step nowhere without a frog. And so Pharaoh's musicians, they turn around and make more frogs, and they create a bigger problem. There's frogs everywhere, so now you got somebody making more frogs, complicating the problem. That's what the devil's crowd does. They complicate the problem. So he calls for Moses, and he comes in. There's frogs re -re 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 jumping all over the place and then everything. Pharaoh's there, and frogs hopping all over him, croaking all over the place. He said, when do you want me to get rid of those things? He said, tomorrow. Amen. Tommy Stone wrote a song, wrote it years ago, One More Night with Them Stinking Frogs. One more night with sin. I had a terrible time with them last night. Just got to do it again. <laughs> it don't make sense, but you got to do it tomorrow. People got issues in their life. Tomorrow. Got a drinking problem. Tomorrow. Right? I'll get right with God. Tomorrow. I just got to do it one more time. You know, we want to fast. I'll, I'll start my fast tomorrow. Right? I'll die it tomorrow. Right? Amen. Honeydew list. I'll do it tomorrow. And then when tomorrow comes, I told you I'd do it tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Proverbs 27. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> So when she fixes dinner, I said I'd do it tomorrow. <laughs> I wash your clothes tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Proverbs 27, verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, 
For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Isn't that amazing? You got no idea if you'll be here tomorrow. You got no guarantee tomorrow. So you got undone projects you need done? You understand? There's things, well, tomorrow I'll go witness to somebody. Tomorrow I'll, I'll pray about that. Tomorrow I'll, might not have a chance. You understand? Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Verse 8. Notice how God looks at this. Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today. Oh. See, when people put off salvation, they don't have tomorrow. It'll be forever. If I won't get saved today, preacher, I'll do it to tomorrow. And they put it off till tomorrow. And they put it off till tomorrow. And it becomes forever. They become eternally lost because they put off what they could do today for tomorrow and it turns into eternity. And they die and go to hell. There's people in hell tonight that never intended to go. They planned on getting saved tomorrow. I'll get saved next week. I'll get saved next month. Next time we have revival, I'll come. Next time Easter shows up, I'll come. Next time. Next time. Tomorrow. Just not ready yet. Tomorrow. Still want to sow some wild oats, preacher. Tomorrow. And it becomes eternity. It becomes forever. The recruiting officer of hell. A lot of people in hell that never intended to go. Wanted to get saved. Believed in their head about Jesus and that he was a savior. But they wouldn't receive them because they had something they wanted to do today that they didn't want to miss out on and said, I'll get saved tomorrow because there's some place I want to go. There's something I want to do. There's something I want to experience. I'm just not ready to walk that line. James chapter 4. Tomorrow minded. James chapter 4, verse 13. Go to now, ye that say what? Today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city and continue there a year, buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what should be on the tomorrow, right? What is your life is even a vapor, to appear for a little time and vanish away. This you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But, ye, but now ye rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth the good, do the not to him it is. Tomorrow mind. Amen. Brother Gary, did you dismiss us quickly for Sunday school?